get my timer on, so we're done by three this afternoon. Turn with me <clears throat> to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. I must say, I'm actually very excited today. Um, I don't think I'm one to fake emotion. I, I actually have a problem with people who get up every Sunday and say, man, it's so great to be in the house of God. And sometimes you, you, you're down, you know. And so I've always been one that I, I like to try to be real. But uh, I haven't been in the pulpit a couple of weeks. I had a couple of things I had to do, and we had some guests we wanted to hear. But I'm excited today uh, about being here. I'm excited about today's message. This is the last sermon in our series on following Jesus <clears throat> what it is and what it is not. And today we're focusing on the study of God's Word, and I'm calling it Fighting the War Using the Word of God. Ephesians 6, 11 through 13 and verse 17. Let's, let's stand. This is Paul writing to the churches in Ephesus. Verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of the enemy in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand in the, to be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. And he's going to go through different pieces of the armor of God, but I want us to skip down to verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Bible, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your Word. And thank you for the freedom and the opportunity today to gather in your house and to worship you and to focus our mind, to refocus them on you. I pray today that you would show us Christ in this message, that your words would come out. Lord, I'm so grateful for the cross and for forgiveness. It's just, it's news that's too good to be true. But it is true that you love us this much. So be with us today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Following Jesus is a life of personal and corporate study of the Bible. It is not a life satisfied with the lack of studying Scripture. It is a life of personal and corporate study of the Bible, it is not a life satisfied with a lack of studying Scripture. Consider these following interesting stories. In the late 80s, I was with a group of Christian college students, and we were uh, coming up from Lakeland and sharing Jesus with strippers and patrons at a strip club on Orange Blossom Trail, now pictured on your screen. One Saturday evening, we were doing this, a wealthy businesswoman drove up in her luxury car. She parked at the club and got out. I happened to be standing in the proximity of her. And as she got out, of course, you know, in my youthful zeal, I'm wanting to beeline and tell everyone about Jesus, um, uh, sometimes without tact. But as I got close to her and she got out, I saw on her front seat of her car the Holy Bible. It's etched in my brain. I even remember what color the seat was and all. Because here I'm at a strip club. Um, please don't take that out of context and put that snippet on the Internet or anything. And a, a woman drives up in her car, gets out, and she's got a Bible on her front seat. And so I remarked to her, Oh! You're here to share Jesus too, aren't you? She says, no, I own this business. And that's about how I reacted with cold pause. I didn't know what to, to, to say. And then she, said, she saw me look at the Bible, and she goes, oh, but the business has nothing to do with my personal faith. 
Another example. A 24-year-old guest preacher who hasn't opened his Bible in about a month feels convicted as he prepares his sermon for the coming Sunday. Maybe that's healthy conviction. Or this, a mother of two who constantly lives in defeat because she, in her thought life, thinks, I'm not good enough for God. So I'd really better study the Word of God every day to be good enough for Him. Maybe that's unhealthy condemnation. Or this fourth example, a housewife who stopped even bringing her Bible to church, much less read it in her own private time, because as she says, what's the use? I can't understand it anyway, even at church. So here's someone defeated and given up about studying the Word of God. And then lastly, a young husband and father who never reads or studies the Bible because he says, I'm good. I took care of that with Jesus some time ago. What do all these have in common? They are all instances of someone fighting a war, a war of the mind, about reading and studying Scripture. And the enemy in this war is Satan himself, our spiritual enemy. A real enemy fighting a real spiritual battle day in and day out with you. Why? Because he does not want you to read or study God's Word. So don't be surprised if sometimes it seems hard or difficult to pull this off. The other thing that's in common with all these stories is that all of these people are someone I know or have met. Those are all real stories. In fact, a 24-year-old guest preacher who felt convicted because he hadn't read his Bible in a month was me. I'll never forget that. Satan does not want you to read or study your Bible because it will help you so much in your life of following Jesus. In this last sermon in this series on following Jesus, what it is and what it is not, I want to challenge and encourage you more than ever before to be determined and to take practical steps to read and study God's Word on a regular basis. Because reading and studying God's Word is a part of following Jesus. Following Jesus is a life of personal and corporate study of the Bible. It is not a life satisfied with the lack of studying Scripture. Now, because I struggled in this area in my life so much at different times, I've done a lot of thinking on this subject about how to help everybody, how to help myself in personal and corporate study of the Bible. And I've thought a lot about the obstacles that are in your way to achieving this goal. How to get believers from preparing a sermon when you haven't read your Bible in a month to now hardly a day goes by when I'm, when I'm not in Scripture. And please don't think that I'm trying to heap praise on me. Um, it's been a long battle. But I'm to a point now where it happens so regularly, I, I almost don't think about it. How, how do I help you get there when many of us have struggled with either legalism and living in guilt like the, the mother who is just so bound up with it and she thinks she has to do it to earn God's grace, or some form of lethargy or apathy. Lethargy is the lack of energy or enthusiasm. And here we're talking about enthusiasm for studying God's Word. Whether that be the man, oh, I'm saved, I took care of that with Jesus, I don't have to do that. Or the young woman, Susan, who had given up because of, she couldn't understand Scripture. Or like the strip club owner, totally unaware of how culture had affected her mind. At least that's a guess. Maybe it was just a facade. How do we help you? You see, Satan wants you to either live in legalistic guilt over, I've not read my Bible enough, or I've got to do this to be good enough for God, or he wants you to just give up. He wants you to give up. I've tried and I've tried. I don't understand it, or I keep failing. And that leads to apathy. Apathy is the feelings of indifference or lack of emotion. I, I don't care anymore. I've done all I can. You know, the word apathy is two parts. A, which in 
older languages negates something like antipasta salad is a salad without pasta. Actually, that's anti, not ah, but you get the point. And apathy means without pathos, the old Greek word for suffering. And it means freedom for suffering. You, you've given up. I don't, I don't need to worry about it anymore. I'm not suffering. I suffered a whole lot when I was younger from the intersection of legalism and a lack of discipline and a lack of practical steps. And later in life, that apathy led to the point where I just thought, I can't learn anything more about Scripture. After my master's degree, that's the way I felt about my personal devotions and study. And it also has a, 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 some to do with my education. But I was very apathetic. But now I'm at a point where I'm really convicted to try to help you and help others. And I'm, I'm not completely convinced we should always be free of suffering. There should be some healthy conviction, but not conviction that I'm not good enough for God. It should be a conviction that, man, I can't believe what he's done for me, and I really want my mind changed on a daily basis. So sometimes we do need to be challenged. Sometimes we need to be scolded. Sometimes we need to be encouraged. As my former dean used to say, figure out when students need a kick in the pants and when they need a hug. I'm kind of hoping today's message is a little bit of both, but with some firm gentleness. So first, I want to remind us about our series and the telic and atelic parts of following Jesus. So I know we've had some guest speakers, but I want to go back to this series and talk about this real quickly. So Hebrews 10, 14, I think, is one of the most powerful verses in the Bible because we learned that by a single offering in the past, Jesus dying for us, he's made perfect... So you're perfect, Stephanie, because you've decided to follow Jesus. Those who are being sanctified, and it's an ongoing process. So because of this one-time event, let's go to the next slide, William, which we call telic in grammar, that is a verb that has a, an, an immediate end point. You hit the ball. Hit is a single event. That's Christ's sacrifice. And most of us, not most of us, Sometimes it's easy to get satisfied in that, like the man says, I've done that. But then we're talking about the ongoing process, the atelic process of ongoing walking with Jesus. Like run doesn't necessarily have an end point. The word follow itself is an atelic verb. So we're talking about following Jesus as a result of what he's done for us. So second... I want to make out the point here that we have to be changed. We have to be changed daily by the truths of Scripture to counter the tremendous amount of wrong thinking that we're bombarded with by our culture on a daily basis. Romans 12, let's go to the next slide. You know, we're bombarded by all this on a daily basis. So many different messages. And Paul tells us in Romans 12, chapter, verse 2, to not be conformed by the world. Those voices are not what should be shaping us. Instead, we should be changed, transformed by the renewing of our mind. And how are we transformed? By staying in God's Word. And not just one time, but regularly. And I'm still amazed. Uh, regularly, not every day, but like when I'm reading or studying or I'm listening to someone teach, like, I never saw that that way before. I was wrong in my thinking, and now God's Word has corrected me. The woman who owned the strip club may be a good example of someone for whom the voice of culture has spoken out louder in her life than the voice of Scripture. What about other ways in which we need our minds transformed today? For many followers in the church today, uh, followers of Christ in America, the voice of politics is greater than an influence in their life than the voice of Christ in Scripture. We don't get our values from the Republican Party. We do not get our values from the Republican Party. We do not get our values from the Republican Party. We do not get our values from the Democrat Party. We do not get our values from independents. We do not get our values from Fox News or Facebook. And these influences are so many 
They're on your phone. They're on your TV. They're in your colleagues because no one's perfect. They're coming at you all at once. And you, we, we do not realize how much we're being affected by all these things. You say, well, well I, don't, I don't know how strong that is. I, this woman at the strip club, that just doesn't seem relevant to me. Well, it shocked me too. But consider the example in Scripture. Now, I've said this before. I'll probably say it many times again. The most telling example of this in Scripture that I know of is Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham argues for Lot's rescue based off of Lot's righteousness. And so when God destroys Sodom and Gomorrah, he rescues Lot and his family. But Lot offers his daughters to the men of the city for rape as an alternative to this evil thing of raping his male guests. Here, take my little girls, rape them instead. And yet, God's just rescued Lot based off of Abraham's logic that he's righteous. And this is confirmed in 2 Peter 2, 7 and 8. Peter calls Lot a righteous man tormented in his soul by the culture around him. Or in the message, he was surrounded by moral rot day after day after day. That righteous man was in constant torment. So that we have this weird phenomenon in Scripture where you can be a follower of Jesus, righteous in your heart, and have extremely warped thinking. How do we fix that? By daily immersing ourselves in the Word of God, or regularly. I'm not talking about legalism. Oops, I missed today. In fact, my primary means of keeping myself in the Word and not missing regularity is an app that uh, broadcasts a devotional on weekdays. So I do something else, or sometimes I miss a Saturday or Sunday. But it's become a regular habit. We need to do that. Third, it does take some discipline and determination. You have to be uh, intentional about this, and that's why we're speaking about it today, to motivate you, to urge you to take real determined steps. But honestly, in this day, day and age, um, I, I'm not a, a, I don't have a problem with the word discipline. <laughs> I need plenty of discipline in my life. But with the way things are these days in the availability of God's Word, it doesn't take near the discipline it used to. And I'll explain that next. But I'm urging you to take steps to make Scripture a part of your daily, regular life in some form. And I am all about practical things. Put note cards around. Put scriptures in your car. I, I used to take a note card and print, print a text on it and put it on the dash of my car because we're not saying you have to read through the Bible a year or read three chapters a day. That was a goal of mine in my uh, early teens or something. Sometimes it's best just to focus on one verse for weeks at a time. And even that has its limitations, because after a week or two, I would get used to the verse on my dash and not look at it anymore. So I'm urging you to take some disciplined steps to make this as a part of your life. Fourthly, and here's where I want to bear down, these days that discipline is not nearly as hard as you think. We live in such a time when it's so easy to get good content on the Word of God, to get the Word of God in ways that we couldn't before. What do I mean by that? A little confession here. I used to absolutely hate Christian radio. Come on, work with me, laugh a little bit. I hated it. I would turn it on and, and have all these negative feelings and turn it off. Why? Why? Well, for one reason, you've heard me say but many times before that all Christian worship is not happy-go-lucky. One-third of the psalms are psalms of grief and lament. You rarely find that in Christian music. But you, you do now, um, and this is also why I'm a U2 Bono fan, because Bono says life is hard. And he has a lot of his popular songs are Christian songs of grief. But the other reason I hated Christian radio was uh, a lot of the talk and discussion was, to me, shallow. 
And I, I, I'm probably offending some of you because you have a great preacher that you listen to on radio. And, and I, I'm not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. One of the oldest style preachers I know of is J. Vernon McGee. And I like listening to J. Vernon McGee. So I'm not throwing it all out. But it got to where I was so dissatisfied, I quit listening to that. Today, though, things are extremely different. With the advent of podcasts and websites and apps and things, you have it everywhere. And I want to spend a, a, a good part of my message today talking about this. We have put this on our website in the past, and I recently found with discussion with some leaders that it wasn't apparent to everyone what we've done. And we're going to show you that in a minute, but I'm not quite there yet, um, William. So um, what's my next slide? Let's go to the next slide. Here. So there are various levels of resources to you available. Now, if you're of an age where podcasts and apps is not in your register uh, and you want to get into that, find one of these young whippersnappers like Samuel or, J or Jack uh, Olivia or someone, and they'll help you because these things are great. So there are various levels. This is a, an app I use, a podcast called 30 Minutes in the New Testament. And I'm actually using it as another way to help me study for our next series, and you can as well. It's a medium level uh, app. And let's go to the next one. And it's on our website. So this is a great new app made by the same people. Uh, this is a podcast. I'm using those words sort of interchangeably. But if you're new to following Jesus or you find that you don't really understand the story, the overall story of the Bible, this is great. Because it's not book by book. It's more topic by topic. It's called A Field Guide to the Bible. And we have it on our website, which we'll show you in a minute. Now, you also can just download an app to just listen to scripture just have it read to you by different voices you can go on on the internet if you go to biblegateway.com and click on the audio link you have like six or eight different uh, voices you can have scripture read to you and you should not fret thinking oh i'm not reading my bible i'm just listening to it that's not good enough that is a lie from the pits of hell Silent reading, reading quietly to yourself, didn't really evolve in Western culture until, I think, around the 400s. So in, in the story, uh, I think it's Act 6, where Philip is running beside the chariot of an Ethiopian eunuch, and he hears the eunuch reading from Isaiah out loud. That's normal. When they did read, they read out loud. And between... I just recently heard another study that it's as low as 3%, as high as 25% in the New Testament times could actually read. But it was an extremely bookish, literate culture. How? Because in that culture, you had people read to you. They read to people everywhere, at banquets, at weddings, at, at dinners. There's even uh, one ancient uh, text that complains that one of the poets uh, recites publicly his poems everywhere, even in the latrine, <laughs> even in the restroom. But I, I use that humorous point to make the point that silent reading to yourself wasn't really in existence during Jesus' times. So don't ever think there's something wrong because I'm listening to the Bible read to me. Uh, one of the most important pieces of technology for my study of Scripture is headphones. I've been working outside this week because it's spring break and I stick those rascals in and I listen while I work. Now, if I have to computate math or something, I have to turn it off. Uh, but, but if I'm just raking or something, man, I, I can listen to that stuff all day long. It makes the raking go a lot better. Now, let me remind you that this has nothing to do with earning your salvation. Nothing. Christ has earned it all. But it is our job to cooperate with the work of God in our lives. Philippians 2.12, a verse that a lot of evangelicals are a little nervous about. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, 
work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You will make it into heaven if you've accepted Christ, but Scripture does talk about some who just barely make it. And wouldn't you rather live a more fulfilling, blessed life because you're immersed in God's Word and you understand things much better? The deeper you go into God's Word over the span of your life, the greater, more fulfilling your life of following Jesus will be, and it will generate more peace in your life. Now, Jack, Sam, all guys, I want to reiterate something I've said before. In my 20s, I didn't have a whole lot of peace in my life. Part of that was just my own maturity and anxiety at that point. Uh, one of my favorite pastors that I have mentioned from the pulpit before, David Swanson, tells the same kind of a story. He was racked with anxiety in his early 20s. So I don't want to say that you start reading your Bible and in two weeks, all your problems go away. But as life gets older and you get deeper in the grace of God and understanding, a greater peace comes into your life. And you won't have that if you're not in the Word of God. Okay, fifth. Uh, lastly, but it's not really my last point. While it is your regular responsibility to get into Scripture, it is not only your job. This might sound a little novel. It's sort of kind of novel in the way I think about it. While it is your regular responsibility to get in Scripture, it is not only your job. I have a role in that as well. Your pastor, your teacher, your small group leader has a role, has a responsibility in teaching you. This is one of the things I had not really... You would say, duh, yeah, but it just didn't really hit me this way until a few years ago. You see, from age 16, I've been called to ministry. And from age 18, I knew that specific calling was teaching Christians. So I'm 57 now. What's that? 39 years, uh, I have been in some degree, uh, sometimes not very disciplined, going deeper in God's Word than perhaps the average follower of Jesus would. And I had overlook that there's a gap so pat knows rockets or something he worked at some top government space agency you know and there's a big gap between his understanding of that field of study and mine kathy worked as an assistant to, to uh, politicians dealing with legal and law and she knows a whole lot more about that than i do in fact on our leadership team when we need something done that way we go to kathy Stephanie is an expert in social media, and boy, is she a good one. I just went to another local church's website uh, this week for another reason, and I thought, man, we have really turned our internet presence and social media around because she's the expert. And I have come to realize it's wrong for a pastor to expect uh, everyday followers of Jesus to just know everything the scholar does. And it's easy to preach and teach without realizing the gap. And I have a responsibility. Your pastor has a responsibility. Ezra 7.10, listen to this. Ezra had devoted himself to the study and observance of the law of the Lord and to teaching its decrees and laws in Israel. So we've not seen a time like this in all of history, in my mind, where you have more of good teaching content available to you than ever before. So avail yourself of good teaching, a good church, if this isn't your church home, I'll let you evaluate if this is good teaching, and be selective about who you listen to. And we've done some of that work for you. We have a whole page on the web where we devote that to you. Now, <clears throat> for the sake of time, I'm, I'm going to skip a few passages, but I want to take some time and make some examples uh, give you two examples of why you need your mind transformed. Bart Ehrman, uh, there we go, thank you, uh, is, the, um, is an agnostic atheist, American New Testament scholar focusing on the New Testament and Jesus, and he works at uh, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. 
He's written 30 books, including three college textbooks, and authored six New, New York Times bestsellers. You think he has some influence in our culture? Yeah, it sounds like he does. Michael Lycona, next slide, is Associate Professor of Theology at Houston Baptist University. Um, he's got quite a few other accolades. He regularly publishes videos on YouTube, which we've linked on this same page I'm going to show you in a minute, on the validity of the Gospels and the resurrection of Jesus. His uh, channel is featured on our webpage under our section called For Skeptics. In 2018, these two guys faced off in a debate, and I was in my garage working on my Miata and listening to this, and I was shocked about some of the things I heard. So I re-listened to this debate yesterday when I was outside so I could prepare for this, and I want to share with you two statements in that debate to make my point clear. The clear that you as a follower need to be an avid student of Scripture. Now, the first point I want to make, it occurs later in the debate, makes the point that you have the ability in your tool belt to fight some of this, if you're just familiar with Scripture. Ehrman says, the Gospels don't claim to be based on eyewitness testimonies. That's what he says. The Gospels don't claim to be based on eyewitness testimonies. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, anyway, they don't, be claim, they don't claim to be based on eyewitness testimonies. Take out your Bible or take out your phone, however you read Scripture. There's one in the pew if you don't have one with you. I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. This is the third book in the New Testament for our newer followers of Jesus. And we have those who listen. Uh, this is the third book in the second half of the Bible called the New Testament. Simply just by knowing the plain sense of Scripture, you can counter some of these arguments. All right, Luke chapter 1. This is Luke telling you about how he wrote his gospel, his book about Jesus. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of things that have been accomplished among us. So Luke is telling you other people have written about Jesus before him. Many. Verse 2. Just as those who were from the beginning eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us. What is them? Them is a pronoun. Pronouns have an antecedent, a word before that it, that it refers to. Them means the narratives that were published before. By whom? Eyewitnesses. It seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past. What has Luke been doing? He's been studying these eyewitness accounts to write his gospel. So how can a six times New York's uh, bestseller list scholar claim that Matthew, Mark, or Luke aren't written on eyewitness testimonies. It's ludicrous. And it's right there for you in plain English. You could also go to uh, 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, um, which is not one of the Gospels, but it's very clear that it's an eyewitness account. So I don't want to go into that too deep because we've got to get you out by 4 o'clock. Um, but that makes the point that if... So here's, a, here's another little sub-point. There's an old phrase I used to hear about where you go to church or who you listen to, and it's this. I want to get under the spout where the glory comes out. You ever heard that one? I want to get under the spout where the glory comes out. And I want to go to church where I'm always blessed. Or, and that also translates into your private studying time. Man, I didn't feel anything today, Jesus. I didn't feel anything. I... Uh, was in a touring group that stayed in homes, uh, guest homes, and I'll never forget this home in Virginia. I got up that morning for breakfast, and the father and two children, and they ate breakfast, and he read a portion of Scripture, closed it, no comment, and they went on to school. And we had an interim pastor in West Palm Beach in our church who talked about doing that every day in his household. Uh, they would read a, a chapter of Scripture, he said, Make a pencil mark, close the Bible, don't lecture your kids and let them go. Reading the Bible on your own is not a matter of getting the goosebumps every time. 
there is more value, I think, in just becoming familiar with Scripture. So if you've read Luke time and time again or whatever, sooner or later, that's going to echo in your head. Wait a minute. Aren't there eyewitnesses somewhere mentioned in the Gospels? And nowadays with Google, you literally can Google any remnant of any verse in any translation and find that verse instantly. We live in a great age for technology. So your own personal study of the Bible, half the time is just being familiar with the story. Let me give you this second quote, and then we're going we're to conclude with something different. The second claim I want to raise from the debate will serve to underscore that you need to, to be under good teaching. You need to have good scholars and teachers in your life. The role of the pastor in helping you learn the Bible. It also serves to introduce our new series starting next week in the Gospel of Mark. So first, Jack has a gift for everybody. A couple of guys. Uh, Fernando, can you help Jack? Yeah, we're going to pass them out really quick. Back when we did Galatians before COVID, we had a copy of Galatians for each of you. We're starting a series on the Gospel of Mark, which is going to help underscore this point. And we have a copy of the Gospel of Mark just for study. It has the text on one side and a blank page on the other so you can follow along and make your own notes. And we're going to do this. Getting them passed out here. We're running a little bit longer today. And Stephanie needs one. Okay. Here's what Ehrman claims in this second point. They're debating about Jesus saying he's God. And the Gospel of John has Jesus saying he's God more than any other Gospel. In fact, it's, it's, Jesus says he's God so much in that book that liberal scholars used to claim John was written like 300 A.D. because it took three centuries for the church to come up with this myth that wasn't true. Uh, that's all been debunked now because they found older manuscripts. So Ehrman's point how can John record Jesus saying, I'm God, I'm God, I'm God, so much? And then Matthew, Mark, and Luke, quote, do not even mention it. I quote, our earliest sources, and by earliest sources, he means Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Our early sources don't even talk about it, end quote. It being the verbal, Jesus verbally claiming to be God. Ehrman makes this claim that not only does John's gospel claim to be God, he goes on to say it, it, if it's so important in John and it really happened, it wasn't enough important enough to even mention it in the other gospels? In none of these sources does Jesus make these claims for himself. Okay, take your, your little mark there and turn to chapter 2, verse 4. Mark 2, verse 4. Stephanie is my time cop because uh, we all know our attention spans on the web are shorter. So I warned her today I was going to break the rules on the time. <coughs> Chapter 2, verse 4. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? So the Pharisees have said only God can forgive sins. And immediately Jesus perceiving in his spirit that they question within themselves, hmm, sounds to me like he's God. Why do you question, he says, why do you question these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic? Your sins are forgiven or rise, take up your bed and walk. But just so you'll know that the Son of Man, he's talking about himself, has authority on earth to forgive sins, then he says to the paralytic, I say to you, rise up, pick up your bed and go home. Think about the logic of that passage. He says, your sins are forgiven, Carol. And they flip out. Only God can say your sins are forgiven. Jesus somehow knows what he's saying. And he goes, oh, that you think only God can do that? Okay. Rise up and walk. And boom, he heals it. Our Ehrman doesn't even understand in 
implicit commentary in stories. What is that story screaming at you? Who is Jesus? He's God, because only God can forgive sins, and only God can heal him. Jesus is like, oh, really? Oh, only God can forgive sins? Well, if that's so, watch this. Get up your bed and go home. Boom. He even knew what they were going to ask in what order, so Jesus intentionally switched this, what he was going to do, and he forgave the guy's sins first so that he could then heal him and prove that he was God. And Ehrman says the, the, these other Gospels don't say that. In fact, Jesus' identity as a divine being is part of the core plot of Mark. Go to Mark 1.1, 1, 1. <clears throat> very first, and I'll read it to you. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written by the Isaiah prophet. So Mark is saying, hey, this is what happened in my story, and it was prophesied by Isaiah. Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. A voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And then verse 4, John appeared baptizing. And if you keep reading, John is announcing Jesus coming. So Isaiah is not prophesying that Jesus will bring God. Isaiah is prophesying that John will bring Jesus. He'll make the way. So I've gone ahead and pulled up the verse that he's bringing to. Let's go to the next slide. This is Isaiah uh, 3 through 5. Uh, this is one of the verses in there. In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Now something, it's available to you, but you probably wouldn't know it. It's in your Bible introduction. When you see the word Lord in all small caps, you see the R is a capital R, but it's, it's short. That is because Jews felt the name of God was too holy to say. We say it today, some modern Christian Jews don't say it, but for the sake of teaching, that's Yahweh. The word Yahweh is too holy to say. In Exodus 3, Moses says, who should I tell him is sending me? I am that I am. That is the name of God. In Hebrew, it's Yahweh. That's the personal name of God. And then if we don't have it clear, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So in the Hebrew is Yahweh. But when a Jewish person would see that, they wouldn't say Yahweh, they'd say Adonai, which is Hebrew for Lord. And that's been tr brought down to your Bibles. So Mark is saying, John the Baptist came to make the path straight for Yahweh. And who in the Gospel of Mark does G John make the path for? He comes before announcing who's coming. Do you know Jesus. And this is repeated in John's gospel as well. But Mark starts his gospel by saying, well, it happened just like Isaiah said it would. This guy's going to come first. He's going to say, make the path straight for Yahweh. And John comes, and then comes Jesus after him. How can a New York Times best-selling author tell you that Mark doesn't even mention the divinity of Christ. If he knows how to read and study as a scholar should, it's screaming at him. And yet that man teaches college students left and right at Chapel Hill. Friends, please, please study the Word of God. All right, let's wrap up. Next slide. So what we want to finish up with here now, and I'm really over, is the practical part of this. But this has been on my heart for a long time. So that's our website, and in the top right, three clicks from the left, says Podcast Plus. I want you to get a visual of it, oasisconwaygardens.org. Now William's going to go to the website. <clears throat> Facebook friends, forgive me for going so long. If I don't preach next week, you know that Stephanie has really held me accountable. Okay, there's the website. Now he's going to click in the, up there, podcast and more. And the second link, podcast and digital study. We've been compiling this for you for a long time because I really want you to know what's there. So as he scrolls down, we have these in categories, daily study. The first there, he's not going to click on those. 
But under daily study, it says walking the way. That is the, the podcast I listen to every morning, weekdays. It's 15 minutes long, has three prayers, and he reads a chapter of Scripture, and he takes three minutes to talk about it. That's what keeps me in rhythm. That's my discipline. Yeah, I study long for sermons. I study long for research or for the university. But I need to be reminded every day and every morning I pray the Lord's Prayer and I ask Him to forgive me and I ask for someone else that I need to forgive. Easy stuff. Uh, then we have basic Bible study and then you have the link to the field guide to the Bible and the Bible Project. The Bible Project is a list of videos for every book of the Bible and all kinds of themes. You can watch a video this week on the Gospel of Mark to get ready. Then you go down to meet even more in depth. And I know you can't see them, but the first one is called 40 Minutes in the Old Testament, and then the second one is called 30 Minutes in the New Testament. You can listen to the entire series on the Gospel of Mark, beginning with episode 215. They're good. They're good. In fact, the Old Testament is even better than the New Testament. Now, we'll scroll down a little bit more. We don't have links for these here, but he, they are, these are pictures of the apps. And if you go down a little bit more, William, the last one on the bottom left is Read Scripture. If you Google Read Scripture app, that is one of the best daily Bible reading apps you can have. Never before have you had more tools to easily listen to the Word of God. Don't add extra guilt on you. Oh, I didn't get on my knees for five minutes today. One of my best mentors tells me his best prayer closet is his car. So what? You're a sinner. You get busy. You, you forget things. Get in a routine of listening on the way to work. It's fine. Find some way to get in the Word of God. So next week, we will start the Gospel of Mark, and I challenge you this week to prepare yourself by availing of yourself of one of these things, reading the scripture journal in your hand, listening to one of these podcasts, watching the Bible Project video on the Gospel of Mark, and we'll see you next week. So we're going to, Emily and Christian are going to come, and uh, we're going to turn to worship. That was a little longer than I hoped, but I hope it made some sense and encouraged you to get into God's Word.